All right. Good morning, church. How y'all doing this morning? Y'all doing all right? Rainy day in Georgia. Glad to see you at church. If it's your first time here, uh, I just want to say a special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Blake. I get the privilege to be one of the pastors here. Maybe you're watching uh, online. Thank you for taking a moment and tuning in with us. Just a few announcements real quick. Uh, next week, uh, we're having our extravaganza. If you don't know what that is, that's just an Easter party, okay? We're going to have it here at the church after the 11 o'clock service will be out back. Uh, if, if you got an invite card, we are asking you, man, invite some people. We want to be this to be a blessing to our church, but be a blessing to the community. And so bring a blanket. There's going to be inflatables for the kids, going to be food, uh, lots of fun and fellowship. If you're heart and soul with Connection Church, just want to encourage you, come to the 9 o'clock service next week and open up room uh, for first-time guests as they come in. Uh, there'll be room in our kids' ministry. And so uh, that's it as far as announcements are concerned. I uh, got the call Friday uh, from Billy, uh, and he told me to start stretching and getting loose in the bullpen. He was supposed to preach this Sunday, but I think he got uh, strep throat, feels better now, but anyway, I feel like Billy Wagner on the Braves. Anybody remember old Billy Wagner for the Braves? I mean, my boy, when he came out of the bullpen, he just, you knew you were about to win the game, all right? He was just going to throw absolute gas, and I absolutely loved it. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be doing that this morning, but I will be preaching. And so if you got uh, your copy of God, God's Word, Exodus chapters 19 and 20, uh, I'm going to pray for us real quick. And then we'll get going, and hopefully we'll throw a few strikes this morning. So pray with me, and we'll get rocking. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your love for us. And God, I thank you for Jesus. God, and your spirit, and your word, and God, you work in our hearts. And I pray that your presence would just be in this place. And God, you would just move in our hearts in a, in a fresh way, God. And that we'd leave here challenged and changed, God, and, and wanting to walk away different than we did when we came in. So I pray you just be with us this morning. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Uh, amen. And so we're still in the book of Exodus, going from Genesis to Revelation uh, in a series called Knowing God. And so three weeks we've been in Exodus, and here's what we've seen. We see Moses in the burning bush. And what we learned is God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things and that he wants to use your life and our life. He doesn't need you to be awesome. He just wants you to be available, to put your yes on the table and say, God, use me. And last week we talked about the deliverance of the Lord and God split a sea and he made a way and he delivered his people. And we talked about how forgetful of the people we are. And every day we should wake up and walk in the shadow of the cross. We should live and work and play in God's grace. We never walk away from it, but we live in it. And then today we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. And what we see in chapters 19 and 20 is God reveals his law to Moses and the Israelites. And here's what I love about our God. He doesn't just leave us hanging. Like he doesn't split a sea and bring them to the other side and say... Good luck, right? But instead, he guides them, and he's with them, and he still loves them. Even in their forgetfulness, he draws us out. He calls us out to draw us in. He's got a purpose for your life. We're just getting started. Uh, when you get saved, that's not the end. God wants to use you. And here's what we're going to see when we talk about the law. It reveals three things to us. It reveals the heart of God. So here's our outline. The heart of God. It reveals the way of life, how we enjoy God the most, and, and how life was intended to be lived. And then three, the need of Christ. When you talk about the law, it actually shows us we need Jesus. And so that's our outline, and so let's work through it together. Uh, the first, I want to talk about the heart of God. Listen to what God's heart is for his people right before he gives the law. Exodus 19, verses 1 through 6. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. And after they set out from Repetidium, is that how you say that word? No way, and you don't know how to say it either, okay? They entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God. 
And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people. Here's what I want you to tell the people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. I carried you on eagles' wings. I brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, on the count of three, say covenant. One, two, three. Then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. You hear how he's talking about his people? Although the whole earth is mine, I own it all, but you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God's heart is to have a group of people that represent him on earth. We're to be a people for God. This is called image bearers. That when people look at your life, you bear God's image. You make gospel decisions with your life. And your life looks different in the world that you live in. We're image bearers of God. To be a people for God's glory. To be witnesses. To witness God's glory in the world where we live, where you work, where you play, that we would be a people hungry about God's glory to reveal his glory to the world. I want you to write this down. The Old Testament Israelites is the New Testament church. You remember, what Egypt was for them is what sin is for us. And you remember the God of Israel, that's our God. And I want you to remember when we think about the Israelites, that's a picture of the New Testament church. Listen to Peter, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 on the screen. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people... But now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That passage sounds a lot like what Moses said, what we just read in Exodus. And this passage gives us our identity of of God's people. I want you to see these three things. One is, A, we're a covenant people. We're his people. We're the people of God. We're people chosen by God. God has showed us and really given us his love, his power, and his presence. Think about the love that you inherited from God. He just lavished it on you. You didn't earn it. He just gave it to you. Uh, me and Easton, we were at the house the other day, and we was in the living room. And I said, hey, buddy, come sit in Daddy's lap. And he climbs up in my lap, and I said, hey, what did Jesus do for you? He said he died on a cross. I said, well, when did he die for you? He said, a long time ago, <laughs> I said, when it, was it when you was a good boy or a bad boy? He said, when I was a bad boy. I said, did he die for daddy when he was a good daddy or a bad daddy? He said, when you was a bad daddy. What does that say about God's love for you? You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it, but he lavished it on us. Listen to what Peter says. Once you, did not, once you had not received mercy, now you have. Peter says, once you were in darkness, but now you're in the light. Moses says, once you were enslaved to Egypt, now you've been set free by God himself to worship him. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished to bestow, to throw on us that we should be called the children of God. We're his chosen people. Think about God's presence with us. God longs to be with his people. This is the story of the Bible. This is the story of you and me as Christians, that God is in me. God is with me. God goes before me. God is behind me. If God is for me, who could be against me? Do you live everyday life as if God was with you? His presence is in you. Uh, Think about the power we have in God. The same power that split the sea was with his people, guiding them, leading them. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave lives in me and lives in you. And think about the magnitude of that identity. That's who you are. God's presence in you. God's power, God's love for you. We're a covenant people. What would change in your life if you knew that to be true? What would change? 
No matter what, God's love is on us. No matter what, God's promised to be there and his presence is with us. No matter what, God promised to be our I am to be whatever we need, whenever we need it. Are you kidding me? Man, what is greater than, than that? This is who we are. This is the church. A group of people characterized by God's love for us and unified by our love for God. That's who we are. This is why the, the God is the God of the world. This is why Jesus ain't white. This is why this ain't God's country. God don't have a country. The world is his footstool. And this is why we're a peculiar people. Differences don't divide us. God alone unites us. And we're united, all of us are. Are you kidding me? How could you not want to be a part of God's church? How could you not want to be a part of this special people that God treasures? And there's that old saying, well, you ain't got to go to church to be a Christian. Well, that's about the dumbest thing I ever heard. Because actually, you do got to be a part of the church to be a Christian. I mean, think about it. I mean, think about when God split the Red Sea for his people. And then you got one person just like, y'all go ahead. I'll catch up later. I ain't got to be a part of y'all to be saved. Hey, God knows my heart. Well, well okay, buddy. But listen, you're going to be crushed. Right? By the Egyptians or by the, the Red Sea, right? God deals with groups of people, not just one particular person, but us as a whole. He loves his people. He died for the church. This is us, a covenant people. Be a, not just a covenant people, he says, a holy nation to be set apart, to be different. What does that even mean to be a holy nation? What does that look like? Well, it looks like a people that's characterized by obedience. It means your yes is on the table. It means that listening to God and doing what he says should be normal in our life. We live in a world that does what they want, when they want, how they want, where they want, with who they want. And what the world does is it don't just disobey God's laws. They write their own. And we just write our own laws. Does this not sound like the world we live in? Are you kidding? Hey, just do what you want. Hey, do it. Just do what feels good. Hey, find your truth. Well, the funny thing is, you don't have to find truth. God revealed truth. And that's the world that we live in. And God wants us to be different. Not writing our own laws and thinking we know how to live our life. Listen to me. Is that not Adam and Eve in the garden? Because here's what happened. What's so special about that tree anyway? What's so special about that piece of fruit? Was it some poisonous cantaloupe that they ate and just, man, sent the world into destruction? Was it this poisonous apple? There wasn't nothing special about the fruit. There wasn't nothing special about the tree. Let me tell you what happened. They decided they knew what was best for their life instead of trusting in what God said was best for their life. And so not only did they disobey God's law, they just wrote their own. And man, ain't that what the world does? Well, man, I feel like this is what's right. Well, man, hey, well, I think this is what's right. And man, we just get our pencil out and we just fill in the blank. But man, God has revealed his truth to us and he wants us to be a people that says, I trust you. I believe you know what's best for my life. And he wants us to be characterized by listening to God and doing what he says. Because listen, a heart that believes is a heart that obeys. A heart that believes is a heart that obeys. And you can look like the world and act like the world. But at that moment, you become like the world. And then you don't have anything to offer the world. He wants us to be characterized by obedience. He wants us to be characterized by godliness. When you experience the gospel... You become like the gospel. It changes everything. Uh, this is called sanctification. You ever hung out with somebody and then start acting like them? Start talking the way they talk or laugh the way they laugh? They start rubbing off on you? Yeah, it happens. I, my daughter, when she has friends come over at the house, my sweet little angel turns into somebody I don't, I've never met before. And I'm like, man, who are you? You coming up in here, why are you treating your brother like that all of a sudden? Why are you acting that way towards us all of a sudden? Because friends rub off on her, and I'm sure she rubs off on her friends. But here's what I know. The gospel rubs off on us. 
You can't experience the gospel and it not wreck your life and change your life. That's what it does. You see, true gospel transformation becomes embodied. And you live it. It starts from the inside out, not the outside in. And it comes out. The roots, the heart, the fruits, what you do, where you go, how you live. It changes everything. That's why at Connection Church, you're going to hear statements like this all the time. The gospel produces generous people. Because God gave his son. And if he gave to me, how could I not want to give? Or statements like this. Saved people live sent. How could God entrust me with the gospel and me sit instead of live sin? Instead of telling everybody what Jesus has done for me and what he can do for them. Or uh, save people, serve people. The God of glory. Jesus Christ left his heavenly fame for an earthly frame. And got on his knees and washed Judas' feet that would portray him. And man, when he washes our feet. And cleans our hearts. We want to serve people the way he served us. Listen to me. People that experience the gospel become like the gospel. And all of a sudden our heart starts to beat for the things that God's heart beats for. Period. Period. That's how you know you're a Christian. Transformation from the inside out. The more we love God, the more we hate sin. The more we love God, the more we want to be like him. And then finally he says, you're a priesthood. Characterized by access to God. This is your identity. Priests had exclusive access in the Old Testament because God gave it to them. And they would make sacrifices and atonements. And they could come talk to God. And when they did, they could meet with God and talk with God and hear his voice. This is what we have in Christ. He's our high priest. He's went before us. He was sacrificed and atoned. And now we have confidence to come to the room boldly. You see, I got a gym membership at 24-7. I know you can tell because how swole I am. I mean, God, look at me. About to bust out these sleeves. And, And here's what I'll tell you. I'm on the roll. My name's in the my name's in the book. I'm on the roll. I got the access. I'm part of the gym family. And I can go in and out, in and out, whenever I want. And can't nobody stop me. That's the confidence I have. But some of y'all ain't going. Because you ain't got the key. And I'm telling you right now, that's what we have. God's people, his presence, his power, his love is on us. A special people. Man, we are a holy nation. We can come to the throne boldly. That's who you are in Jesus. Not only, watch this, not only that, not only a covenant people. Not only a holy nation. He says, you're my, see, treasured possession. Man, God's possession to to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world to play. Not only does he give us great identity, he gives us incredible purpose. Listen to Exodus. In Exodus, God's purpose is to establish the Israelite people. He wants to establish this people and for them to represent his glory into the world. And Peter says, this is our purpose, to declare the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into light. Listen to Luke in Acts 1.8. You'll receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're his witnesses. God's revealed his heart to us. For us to turn around and reveal his heart to the world, the Israelites were supposed to be a blessing to other nations around them. And when God pulled them out of slavery, they were to be a blessing to the nations around them. That when people look at the Israelites, they say, them people ain't perfect. Them people might look crazy. But how they live their life, that's how life's supposed to be lived. By how they love God and by how they love one another. That's the church we're trying to be. Why do you think we call uh, it the 1-8 project? Man, we don't care so much about a building. Man, this, this is the church here. We're doing fine here. This is God's place here. God doesn't live in a building built by human hands. But we want to be witnesses to our city, to our communities, to our state, to our nation, to the world. We want to be witnesses for Jesus. This is who we're called to be, Connection Church. When people look at your life, they say, I don't know what it is about them, but they're a different person. 
They're different people, and they might not be perfect, but the way they live their life is attractive, and that's how life is supposed to be lived. Jesus says in Matthew 28, his last words were, go make disciples of all nations. That's your purpose, and as a body of Christ, the church is his plan A to accomplish that, pur that purpose on the earth. Are you kidding me? That God would use me. Who am I but a man? That God has a purpose for my life greater than any purpose that I could ever have on my own. Man, what a privilege. And some of you need to hear this this morning. God wants to use you. God's plan he has for you is better than the plan you got for yourself. I promise you. And what a privilege. God of glory. Use me. Really? Well, what if the President of the United States called? And you may hate him or you may love him. And he may be a Democrat or he may be a Republican. It doesn't matter. But what if they called you and say, hey, I want you. I want you to join my team. And we're going to change the world. And by the way, you don't got to know what you're doing. I'm going to go with you everywhere you go. And I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. You would be honored. The president of Google calls. The president of Apple. Oh my God, Brady, he want me on their team. That's crazy. Well, I can't say that, and neither can you, but here's what I can say. God, who created it all, wants to use your life. And that's a privilege unlike any privilege in this world. What a purpose he has. And so have you discovered your identity? That's who you are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, that's who you're not. But that's who we are in Jesus. And listen to me. Are you walking in that identity and purpose every day in your life? Because that's who you are and that's who God's called you to be. Not only do we see the heart of God, but guys, we see the way of life. The way of life. This is the way in which we enjoy God most. And the way that life works best. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path to life. This is life. This is how it was intended to be lived. And as a church and Christians, when we strive for this, life is better for you. Listen to Exodus 21 through 21. And God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on earth, beneath, or in waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents. Woo, listen to that, parents. To the third and to the fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Only at all shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your animals. My dog don't really work, but I guess they had animals that did. Nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. It is good for you. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother. So that you may live long in the land, and the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Any of y'all saw someone else's house that you was like, I wish that was my house? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. We ain't even going to talk about that. Or his male or female servant. Or his ox or donkey. Anybody got any donkeys? He might as well said Tahoes and cars, the trucks they drive, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stared at a distance. They stayed and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. Do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you. 
so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the darkness where God was. The centerpiece of God's covenant is the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments reveal and reflect God's righteousness. In other words, this is the standard. This is the bullseye. This is God's righteousness. He's a holy God. This is his standard for his people. And many times the Ten Commandments get a bad rap because you look at that and say, I'm screwed. I can't do that. If that's what it takes to be saved, I can't do it. If that's what it takes to have a relationship with God, I can't do it. And you say, man, I'm in bad shape. Yes, you are. But however, that is not what God intended to save you. That's called justification. But the Ten Commandments were intended to sanctify us. That's called sanctification. It's something to look at. And what they will do is they'll reveal to you your sin and it points you to Jesus. Because he did keep them. The law isn't bad, it's good. It's a gift to them and it's a gift to us. So let's look at the law. One is A, it's a blueprint to live by. When you build a house, you have a blueprint. And you can build... Not with a blueprint, but it ain't going to go well. Blueprints change everything. When A blueprint is a written instruction on how things are supposed to be, and things go better when you read the directions. A few years ago, uh, Easton got a bicycle for Christmas, and I got the honor and the privilege to put that thing together the night before. Anybody ever put a bicycle together for a kid the night before, on Christmas Eve? Trampoline, somebody. And, and, and my wife asked me, do you want to look at the blueprints? Do you want to read the directions? And I did what every other man in this world did. I don't want to look at the directions. I've been riding bikes for years. I know how to put this thing together. About three hours later, handlebars are on backwards. The seat's on, on backwards. I wish I would have read the blueprints. These are God's blueprints. And for the saved person, they provide us a new way of life. Think about the Israelites. 400 years in slavery. You kidding me? And then God brings them out. They didn't have a clue how to live. They didn't have a clue what was right and wrong, what to do, where to go. No clue. Can you think about the time when God saved you? Did you know how to live the Christian life? Heck no. When you got saved, you didn't have a clue. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to live. I wanted to get a sleeping bag and just sleep on the altar at church and just stay there. I was scared to death to go out into the world. I didn't know how to live. But God reveals it to us. And that's what he does with his laws. He reveals to us how we should live, what we should do as his people. Think about the Ten Commandments. He gives us a blueprint. Let's look at them together. The first four give us a blueprint on how to love God. You want to love God? Here's how you love God. One, you shall have no other gods before me. God is one. But the question is, is he one in our life? Because God wants first place, not second best. How do we love God? Two, you shall have no carved images of me. And God says, listen, I want you to love me for who I am. Not for who you think I should be. And not for who you want me to be. But love me for who I am. Number three, you shall not take my name in vain. Don't use God's name for selfish gain. In the name of Jesus. In the name of God. Don't use his name for selfish gain. And don't use his name contrary to his nature and who he is. Uh, Remember the Sabbath. Your rest. Your identity. Your value comes in not what you do. And where you work, where you work, it comes in who God is and finding your value, identity, and work and rest in Him. The last six give us a blueprint on how to love others. Five says, honor your parents. Your parents are the closest neighbors you have most of your life. And you may not agree with them and you may not like them at times, but you should at very best honor the people that's taking care of you and the people that God's put as authority in your life. He says, you shall not kill. 
We should value all of human life. All of it. Born and unborn. All, all nations. All people. Because we're made in the image of God. You hear me? My dog ain't made in the image of God. Now, I love him, but he ain't made in the image of God. He don't have to worry about having a relationship with God. He don't have to worry about how to pray. My dog don't have to worry about fasting unless we forget to feed him. He doesn't have to worry about that. But you're made in God's image. All people are in God's image. He says, you shall not kill. He says, you shall not commit adultery. Be faithful. You shall not steal. Be honest. You shall not lie. Be trustworthy. You shall not covenant. covet. Be content with what God's given you. And when you operate in these things, it results in joy in your life because your identity and focus and rest isn't in the world, but it's in God himself. And it brings joy into your life, not only a blueprint to live by, but guardrails to stand on. The purpose of guardrails is protection. It's the tracks for a train. It's the rails on the side of a bridge. And they protect you and others. Now watch this. As long as you keep it between the rails, as long as you keep it between the lines, you're in good territory. But as soon as you cross over the line, as soon as you get out of bounds, as soon as you go over the rails, you're in trouble and so is everybody else around you. When you walk outside the Ten Commandments, disaster happens. Listen to this quote by Tony Evans. Since people have the propensity to just do whatever suits them in the moment. God's commandments establish boundaries to restrain evil. And following the commandments give people protection from themselves, praise God, and from one another. Laws promote order in society and prevent chaos. The law ain't bad, you're bad, you're speeding, not the law. The law's not bad, the law is good. Think about the chaos and destruction that comes when you choose not to follow these commands. Think about adultery, it brings destruction. It destroys people's lives. It overpromises and underdelivers. Sin overpromises and underdelivers. It says one thing but gives you another thing. Has you chasing your tail all your life. Think about the refusal of Sabbath rest. It brings destruction. It leads to burnout, health issues, and it reveals that our identity is in the wrong thing because we're trying to find our value and our purpose and what we do for a living and not in God Himself. And I'm telling you, think about it. Think about uh, adultery and lies. They bring destruction. You're not just cheating on your spouse, you're cheating on your family. When a satanic thought comes to my mind or, man, if, if temptation comes, I just look at my little girl. And I say, God, help me to never. Help me to never walk outside the covenant I have with my wife. Think about the destruction. God's not a killjoy. He's trying to save you from things that will kill your joy. Think about every one of these. Think about coveting. This is the worst. It destroys contentment in your life. You can't enjoy what you got because you're too worried about what everybody else has. And every single one of these, pull your eyes off God and you start walking in forgetfulness. And now instead of having your eyes on his rules, you're writing your own rules and you lean to your own understanding. Every time in scripture where God gives dis dis instructions, the devil brings destruction. Every time. He's in the corner waiting to be, waiting to derail you. And how he does it is he wants you to play into your sin and he wants you to lean to your own understanding instead of going by the blueprint. Not only is it a blueprint, not only is it guardrails to stand on, but it's God's word to delight in. Listen to David speak about God's law. Psalm 19, 7 through 12. The law of the Lord is perfect. Refreshing to the soul, the statuses of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm. They are what they are. And all of them are righteous, every single one of them. And they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there's great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden 
thoughts. Listen again, Psalm 119, 9 through 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart. Man, you want to learn how to live. Hide God's word in your heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With your lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts, consider your ways, I delight in your decrees, I will not neglect your word. Now listen to Paul talk about it. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed. God doesn't breathe in scripture, he breathes out scripture. All of it is God breathed. Breathe, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. I've never met a Christian that doesn't absolutely love and cherish the Word of God. It's like cologne. I just want to put it on me. Just take it with me everywhere I go. It's, it's something that we delight in. We absolutely love it. That's why we sing it. That's why we pray it. That's why we read it. That's why we preach it. And that's why when people preach it, people say, Amen, because they like what they hear when they hear the truth. Of God. Now, I ain't been hearing some of y'all say amen this morning, and y'all might not like what I'm saying, but what I'm telling you is this a Christian has absolute hunger for the Word of God. Absolute. When we treasure the God of the Bible, we treasure God's Word in the Bible. And this to a Christian is not a job, but my God, my God, it is a joy. It is such a joy. We see the heart of God. We see the way of life. And third, we see the need of Christ. Nothing reveals our need for Jesus more than the law. It's a great revealer in our life. And reading the law can make you feel like a terrible person. Ding, 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 ding. That's this intention. Because sin is in our life. Anytime you read the Bible, period, you can walk away feeling down sometimes. Because it's a scalpel, God uses to get in there and cut and take things out that shouldn't be there and put stuff in there that should. There's a guy that used to come to our church. He loves our church. He said, man, I love y'all's preaching. I love the worship team. I love the people. They're one of the nicest people. Y'all have great, hospitable people there. He said, but every time I leave, I feel like trash. I was like, bro. That's awesome. Have you ever, you ever thought that that might be the Spirit like working inside your heart, wanting to take some things and do some things in your life? Listen to me. Romans 7, Paul says, the law shows us we're sinners. The same way you look in a mirror and see your hair is bad. When we look in the Bible and its laws, it points out the sin in our life and points us to Jesus. That's who it points to. Let me show you what I mean. I want to take a little test together. I know we're uh, competitive people by nature. And so I just want to go through the Ten Commandments. And as I go through them, just in your head write out yes or no. Or W for win or L for loss. Y'all ready? Y'all ain't ready. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Command number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Can you honestly say, Blake, I've never put anything before God in my life. He's always had first place in my heart. He's always been my number one. You say, Blake, Jesus has always been preeminent in my thoughts, in my affections, in my actions. Can you say, I have never been more excited about any other relationship than my relationship with God. Not a new romance, not a new job, not a promotion, not a possession. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get more fired up about the Braves than I do sitting and spending time with God and worshiping Him. It's an L for me. Command number two, you shall have no carved images of me. This command is about turning God into what you want him to be. Because you wish he was a different way. And so what happens is, in your mind, not even knowing it, you create a God that never disagrees with you. And that's not God. You can't even have a relationship with that God. That's just the God of your imagination. It's an L for me. Command number three, you shall not take my name in vain. This has to do a lot more with not saying the word GD. This 
this has more to do with how highly we regard the name of God. Can you say, I have never used God's name in a swear word? Can you say, I have always held his name to the highest respect? Can you say, I have always responded and respected his name? For example, I've never said that I'm a follower of his with my lips, but live contrary with my life. Have you always lived up to the name of Christian? I don't know about you, but it's an L for me. Command number four, remember the Sabbath. This has to do with giving God fully what belongs to Him. And the Bible says that out of everything that God has given you, two things belong to Him, your time and our resources. He wants you to give that back to Him, your time and your resources. Can you say that you have consistently given God all that was due to Him? Can you say that every single week you have marked out a time to worship Him with local believers? I don't know about y'all. It's an L for me. Command number five, honor your parents. This has to do with how you relate to the authorities in your life. Or your, and your parents are first. And they're a representation of God's authority to you. Can you say, I've never disobeyed or dishonored my parents? Have you always respected them and honored them willingly with your obedience? What about God-given authorities in your life? Government officials, your boss, the local police. And I see the way y'all drive on 280. It's an L for me. Command number six, you shall not kill. Anybody ever kill anybody? You say, yes. Finally, I get a W. Well, no, you don't. Jesus messed that up for you. He says to hate someone in your heart or desire their harm is like murder. Have you ever watched your kids do something you tell them not to do a hundred times and then you kind of wish they'd fall and get hurt? You ever? Some of y'all can't even make it in the church house without judging folks. You know what I'm saying? It's an L for me. It is an absolute L for me. Uh, command number seven, you shall not commit adultery. You say, Blake, I'm good here. I ain't even married. Yeah, Jesus got you on this one too because Jesus says to think lustful thoughts about someone to whom you're not married is committing adultery in your heart. And that's what he sees as your heart. And I know some of you women in here, you're like, man, that's more of a man thing. I don't struggle with that. But I know you watch Grey's Anatomy. And I know how you looked at Mr. McDreamy. And I know some of you read the book uh, Fifty Shades of Grey or Fifty Shades of Gross or Fifty Shades of Gonorrhea, whatever you want to call it. It's an L for you. Command number eight, you shall not steal. Can you say, I've never taken anything that wasn't mine. Man, I've never used the company time to check Facebook or watch YouTube. Have you ever robbed God by not giving him your 10%? It's an L for me. Command number nine, you shall not lie. Any liars in the house? Some of you lie and don't even know you lie. That's how good you lie. You just lie. Some of you lie by just not telling the truth. You're just, you lie in your silent, silentness. And some of you, you lie because you just exaggerate, you exaggerate the good things in your life and you downplay the bad things in your life. You're just not telling the whole truth. It's an L for me. Command number 10, you shall not covet. This is the worst one. Can you say, I have never been greedy for something that wasn't mine? Can you say, I've never been jealous of someone else's abilities or their looks or their position or possessions that they have I wish I had? Thanks a lot, Chip and Joanna Gaines. You ruined it for everybody. I remember when I worked in Oregon, I would walk into homes, some nice homes, and I'd walk into their master bathroom and bedroom. I didn't even want to go home and sleep in my bed. It's like, man, this is nice. It's an L for me. If we're honest, we're 0 for 10. We're all in the L category when it comes to salvation. The whole entire room's been leveled. This is the bad news. When you go to a jewelry store, what they'll do, watch them, they'll take the black velvet backdrop and they'll lay it on the counter. That's the black velvet backdrop. Then they'll take the diamond and they put it on top of the black velvet backdrop and that black velvet backdrop makes the diamond show all its colors and beauty and just makes it beautiful. This is the black velvet backdrop. 
You're 0 for 10, bro. That's the bad news. But it makes the good news that much better. It makes Jesus that much brighter. It shows us how great he is and what he's done. Let me introduce you to your Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 on the screen. He who knew no sin became sin on your behalf. So we could become the righteousness of God. He passed the test. We failed. Not only did Jesus pass the test, he passed plus the test. Because he passed the Ten Commandments and all the other laws in between. He lived a perfect life. But not only did he pass the test, he paid the price. He became sin. He traded places with us on our behalf. There was a little boy. Who, who lived with his grandma. And he had problems wetting the bed. And he's in the fifth grade. But every single night he'd wet the bed. And it was his birthday. And they wanted to have friends over to come spend the night with him. And he was embarrassed because he said, man, I'm going to wake up in the morning. And I hope I don't wet the bed. The next morning, all the kids, all his friends was up. And they were playing in the house. And his grandma walked in the bedroom. And there he was in the bed. And he had wet the bed and everything on the bed, the sheets. And he was, he was just, man, just didn't want to get up. He's ashamed. And that grandma took that cup of coffee she had in her hand. And she threw it on the bed. And she said, I just spilled my coffee everywhere. I wet the sheets. I wet you. Now you got to get up and change. You know what she did for him? She covered for him because she loved him. And love covers a multitude of sins. And that's what Jesus did for me. And that's what Jesus did for you. But he did not stop there. He gave us his spirit. And he writes his laws on our heart. And now following them ain't burdensome. They're joyful. Ezekiel 36, 26 on the screen. And I will put my spirit in you. And I will move you to follow my decrees. Be careful to keep my laws. When you get saved, there's a divine heart transplant that takes place in your life. And now it's not behavior modification. It's heart transformation. You can't put a band-aid on a soul level wound. You gotta have your heart changed. You gotta have your heart changed. When I was about five years ago, I had an accident with a knife and I cut my arm. Went to the hospital, they sewed it up. But the problem was on the inside and it was still bleeding. And so I had to go back and have surgery. They had to cut me open, go in there and fix the hole that was on the inside of my arm. And then instead of stitching it up, they let it heal from the inside out. That's the gospel. It's from the inside out, not from the outside in. you got a hole in your heart. And the only thing that's going to change it is Jesus Christ and the love and what he did on the cross for you. He didn't abolish the law. They're good, but he fulfilled them where you can't. That's the difference in religion and the gospel. Listen, religion says God will love us if we change. The gospel says God loves us and it changes us. Religion says do. The gospel says done. Religion says I obey, therefore I'm accepted. The gospel says I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Religion says clean yourself up and come to God. The gospel says you're not coming. You're not. You're never going to come. And you're never going to clean yourself up. That's why Jesus comes to you. He saved me on the front porch in Johnson's Corner. He met me where I was, and he meets you where you are. Rules don't change people's hearts, but the love of God absolutely wrecks them. It wrecks them, and that's what you need. You need to be wrecked. You need God's love to change your heart. You're never going to get to a place where God loves you. He loves you now. And what are you going to do with Jesus? In the Bible, in the New Testament, there's a woman. And she's surrounded by Pharisees. And Jesus walks up. And they see Jesus walk up and they say, Hey, Jesus, this woman's committed adultery. The law says, stone her. What do you say? And then Jesus looked at them and said this. Those of you who've never sinned, you throw the first stone. And slowly, rocks started falling. 
And they drop their rocks and they walk away. And he picks her up. And he says, where are your accusers? Who, who condemns you now? She was condemned until Jesus showed up. And she looks around. She says, I have none. They're all gone. And Jesus looks at her and says, I don't condemn you either. That's us. By the law, we're condemned. But Jesus came and instead of we being stoned, he was stoned for us. And what you got to understand is this is not a works-based righteousness. You will never live a life good enough. You will never live life good enough to have a relationship with God. You got to be saved by the work he did for you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, listen to me. Listen to me. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And that's not hate speech. That's love speech. That's not a hellfire and brimstone. That's gospel preaching. And I'm telling you, why would you keep running from a God that ran for you? And he's telling you, don't you want to be a part of my people? Don't you want a seat at the table? Don't you want to be my treasured possession? I've died for you. Come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. God, thank you for loving us. God, I'm so thankful that I don't have to earn anything. You've done everything. I'm glad that I can come as I am. And if you're here this morning, you say, Blake, I know I don't pass the test, but I believe Jesus passed it for me. And you say, I know I don't have a relationship with God, but God's working in your heart right now. And you say, today is the day of salvation. And today, I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, will you raise your hand so I can just pray for you? I just want to pray for you. My God's moving. the rest of us, God. We love you. We thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. In Christ's name we pray.